What's going on here? What's going on? Attracted no doubt by Malfoy's shout, Argus Filch came shouldering his way through the crowd. Then he saw Mrs. Norris and fell back, clutching his face in horror. My cat! My cat! What's happened to Mrs. Norris? He shrieked, and his eyes and his popping eyes fell on Harry. You! He screeched. You! You murdered my cat! You killed her! I'll kill you! Oh, Argus! Dumbledore had arrived on the scene, followed by a number of other teachers. In seconds, he had swept past Harry, Ron, and Hermione, and detached Mrs. Norris from the torch bracket. Come with me, Argus, he said to Filch. You too, Mr. Potter, Mr. Weasley, and Miss Granger. Lockhart stepped forward eagerly. My office is nearest, Headmaster. Just upstairs. Please feel free. Thank you, Gilderoy, said Dumbledore. The silent crowd parted to let them pass. Lockhart, looking excited and important, hurried after Dumbledore. So did Professors McGonagall and Snape. As they entered Lockhart's darkened office, there was a flurry of movement across walls. Harry saw several of the Lockharts in the pictures dodging out of sight, their hair in rollers. The real Lockhart lit the candles on his desk and stood back. Dumbledore laid Miss Norris on the polished surface and began to examine her. Harry, Ron and Hermione exchanged tense looks and sank into chairs outside the pool of candlelight. Into, th yeah. Watching, the tip of Dumbledore's long crooked nose was barely an inch from Mrs. Norris's fur. He was looking at her closely through his half moon spectacles, his long fingers gently prodding and poking. Professor McGonagall was bent almost as close. Her eyes narrowed. Snape loomed behind them. Half in shadow, wearing a most peculiar expression. It was as though he was trying hard not to smile, and Lockhart was hovering around all of them, making suggestions. It was probably a curse that killed her. Probably the trans Morgifian torture. I've seen it used many times. So unlucky I wasn't there. I know exactly I know the very counter curse that could have spared that could have saved her. Lockhart's comments were punctuated by Filch's cry. I'm sorry, dry, racking sobs. He was slumped in a chair by the desk, unable to look at Mrs. Norris, his face in his hands. Much as he detested Filch, Harry couldn't help feeling a bit sorry for him, though not nearly as sorry as he felt for himself. If Dumbledore believed Filch, he would be expelled for sure. Dumbledore was now muttering strange words under his breath and tapping Mrs. Norris with his wand. But something happened. She continued to look as though she'd been recently stuffed. I remember something very similar happening in Wagadougou said Lockhart. A series of attacks, the full stories in my autobiography, I was able to provide the townsfolk with various amulets which cleared the matter up at once. The 
The photos of Lockhart on the walls were all nodding in agreement as he talked. One of them had forgotten to remove his hairnet. At last Dumbledore straightened up. She's not dead, Argus, he said softly. Lockhart stopped abruptly in the middle of counting the number of murders he had prevented. Not dead? choked Filch, looking through his fingers at Mrs. Norris. But why is she all, all stiff and frozen? She has been petrified, said Dumbledore. Ah! Thought so, said Lockhart. But how I cannot say. Ask him, shrieked Filch, turning his blotched and tear-stained face to Harry. No second year could have done this, said Dumbledore firmly. It would take dark magic of the most advanced. He did it, he did it, Filch spat, his pouchy face purpling. You saw what he wrote on the wall. He found in my office. He knows armour. Armour. Filch's face worked horribly. He knows I'm a squib, he finished. I never touch Mrs. Norris, Harry said loudly, uncomfortably aware of everyone looking at him, including all, lock, all the lock arts on the walls. And I don't even know what a squib is. Rubbish, snarled Filch. You saw my quick spell letter. If I might speak, Headmaster, said Snape from the shadows, and Harry's sense of foreboding increased. He was sure nothing Snape had to say was going to do him any good. Potter and his friends may have simply been in the wrong place at the wrong time, he said. A slight sneer curling in his mouth, as though he doubted it. But we do have a set of suspicions at suspicious circumstances here. Why were they up? Why were they in the upstairs corridor at all? Why weren't they at the Halloween feast? Harry, Ron, and Hermione all launched into an explanation about the Death Day party. There were hundreds of ghosts. They'll tell you we were there. But why not join the feast afterwards? Said Snape, his black eyes glittering in the candlelight. Why go up to that corridor? Ron and Hermione looked at Harry. Because, because... Harry said, his heart thumping very fast. Something told him it would sound very far-fetched if he told them he had been led there by a bodiless voice no one but he could hear. Because we were tired and wanted to go to bed, he said. Without any supper, said Snape, a triumphant smile flickering across his gaunt face. I don't think ghosts provided food fit for living people at their parties. I didn't think ghosts provided food fit for living people at their parties. We weren't hungry, said Ron loudly, as his stomach gave a huge rumble. Snape's nasty smile widened. I suggest, Headmaster, that Potter is not being entirely truthful, he said. It might be a good idea if he were deprived of certain privileges until he is ready to tell us the whole story. I personally feel he should be taken off the Gryffindor Quidditch team until he is ready to be honest. Really, Severus, said Professor McGonagall sharply, I see no reason to stop the boy playing Quidditch. This cat wasn't hit over the head with a broomstick. There is no evidence at all that Potter...
has done anything wrong. Dumbledore was giving Harry a searching look. His twinkling, light blue gaze made Harry feel as though he was being x-rayed. Innocent until proven guilty, Severus, he said firmly. Snape looked furious. So did Filch. My cat has been petrified, he shrieked, his eyes popping. I want to see some punishment! We will be able to cure her, Argos, said Dumbledore patiently. Madame Sprout recently managed to procure some mandrakes. As soon as they have reached their full size, I will have a... No, sorry. Yeah. I will have a potion made which will revive Mrs. Norris. I'll make it, Lockhart butted in. I must have done it a hundred times. I could whip up a mandrake restorative draught in my sleep. Excuse me, said Snape icily, but I believe I am the potions master at this school. There was a very awkward si a very awkward pause. You may go, Dumbledore said to Harry, Ron and Hermione. They went as quickly as they could without actually running. When they were a floor up from Lockhart's office, they turned into an empty classroom and closed the door quietly behind them. Harry squinted at his friends' darkened faces. Do you think I could have told them about the voice I heard? No, said Ron without hesitation. Hearing a voice no one else can hear isn't a good sign, even in the wizarding world. Something in Ron's voice made Harry ask, You do believe me, don't you? Of course I do, said Ron quickly. But you must admit it's weird. I know it's weird, said Harry. The whole thing's weird. What was that writing on the wall about? The Chamber of Secrets has been opened. What's that supposed to mean? You know, it rings a sort of bell. Ron, said Ron slowly. I think someone told me a story about a secret chamber at Hogwarts once. Might have been, might have been Bill. And what on earth's a squib, said Harry. To his surprise, Ron stifled a snigger. Well, it's not funny really, but as it's built, he said, a squib is someone who was born into a wizarding family but hasn't got any magic powers. Kind of the opposite of muggle-born wizards. But squibs are quite unusual. If Filch is trying to learn magic from a quick spell course, I reckon he must be a squib. It would explain a lot, like why he hates students so much. Ron gave a satisfied smile. He's bitter. A clock chimes somewhere. Midnight, said Harry. We'd better get to bed before Snape comes along and tries to frame us for something else. For a few days, the school could talk of little but the attack on Mrs. Norris. Filch kept it fresh in everyone's minds by pacing the spot where she had been attacked, as though he thought the attacker might come back. Harry had seen him scrubbing the message on the wall, with Mrs. Scoer's all-purpose magical mess remover, but to no effect, the words still gleamed as brightly as ever on the stone. When Filch wasn't guarding the scene of the crime, he was skulking red-eyed through the corridors, lunging out of, at unsuspecting students and trying to put them into tension for things like breathing loudly and looking happy Ginny Weasley seemed very disturbed by Mrs. Norris's fate. According to Ron, she was a great cat lover. But you hadn't really got to know Mrs. Norris, Ron told her bracingly. Honestly, we're much better with that we're much better off without her. Ginny's lip trembled. 
Stuff like this doesn't happen at Hogwarts, Ron assured her. They'll catch the nutter who did it and have him out of here in no time. I just hope he's got some petri I just hope he's got time to petrify Filch before he's expel <laughs> he's expelled. I'm only joking. Ron added hastily as Ginny blanched. The attack had also had an effect on Hermione. It was quite usual for Hermione to spend a lot of time reading, but she was now doing almost nothing else. Nor could Harry and Ron get much response from her when they asked what she was up to. And not until the following Wednesday did they find out. Harry had been held back in potions where Snape had made him stay behind to scrape tube worms off the desks. After a hurried lunch, he went upstairs to meet Ron in the library and saw Justin Finch Fletchley, the Hufflepuff boy from Herbology, coming towards him. He had just opened his mouth to say hello when Justin caught sight of him turned abruptly and sped off in the opposite direction. Harry found Ron at the back of the library, measuring his... History of Magic Homework Professor Binns had asked for a three foot long composition on the medieval assembly of European wizards. I don't believe it, I'm still eight inches short, said Ron furiously, letting go of his parchment, which sprang back into a roll, and Hermione's done four feet seven inches, and her writing's tiny. Where is she? asked Harry, grabbing the tape measure and unrolling his own homework. Somewhere over there, said Ron pointing along the shelves, looking for another book. I think she's trying to read the whole library before Christmas. Harry told Ron about Justin Finch Fletchley running away from him. Don't know why you care. I thought he was a bit of an idiot, said Ron, scribbling away, making his writing as large as possible. All that rubbish about Lockhart being so great. Hermione emerged from between the bookshelves. She looked irritable and at last seemed ready to talk to them. All the copies of Hogwarts The History have been taken out, she said, sitting down next to Harry and Ron. And there's a two week waiting list. I wish I hadn't left my copy at home, but I couldn't find it in my trunk with all the Lockhart books. Uh, fit it in my trunk of all the Lockhart books. Why do you want it? said Harry. The same reason everyone else wants it, said Hermione. To read up on the legend of the Chamber of Secrets. What's that? said Harry quickly. That's just it. I can't remember, said Hermione. biting her lip, and I can't find the story anywhere else. Hermione, let me read your composition, said Ron desperately, checking his watch. No, I won't, said, Herm said Hermione, suddenly severe. You've had ten days to finish it. I only need another two inches, go on. The bell rang. Ron and Hermione led the way to History of Magic bickering. History of Magic was the dullest subject on their timetable. Professor Binns, who taught it, was their only ghost teacher, and the most exciting thing that ever happened in his classes was his entering the room through the blackboard. Ancient and shriveled, many people said he hadn't noticed he was dead. 
he had simply got up to teach one day and left his body behind him in an armchair in front of the staff room fire. His routine had not varied in the slightest since. Today was as boring as ever. Professor Binns opened his notes and began to read in a flat drone, like an old vacuum cleaner, until nearly everyone in the class was in a deep stupor, occasionally coming round long enough to copy down a name or date, then falling asleep again. He had been talking, he had been speaking for half an hour when something happened that never happened before. Hermione put up her hand. Professor Binns, glancing up in the middle of a deadly dull lecture on the International Warlock Convention of 1289, looked amazed. Miss, uh, Granger, Professor, I was wondering if you could tell us anything about the Chamber of Secrets, said Hermione in a clear voice. Dean Thomas, who had been sitting with his mouth hanging open, gazing out the window, jerked out of his trance. Lavender Brown's head came up off her arms and Neville's elbow slipped off his desk. Professor Binns blinked. My subject is history of magic, he said in his dry, wheezy voice. I deal with facts, Miss Granger, not myths and legends. He cleared his throat with a small voice, like chalk snapping, and continued. In September of that year, a subcommittee of Sardinian sorcerers, he stuttered to a halt, and Miney's hand was waving in the air again. Miss Grant! Please, sir. Don't legends always have a basis in fact? Professor Binns was looking at her in such amazement. Harry was sure no student had ever interrupted him before, alive or dead. Well, said Professor Binns slowly, yes, one could argue that, I suppose. He peered at Hermione, as though he had never seen a student properly before. However, the legend of which you speak is such a very sensational, even ludicrous tale, but the whole class was now hanging on Professor Binns every word, or well, Professor Binns is every word. He looked dimly at them all, every face turned to his, Harry. could tell he was completely thrown by such an unusual show of interest. Oh, very well, he said slowly. Let me see. The Chamber of Secrets. You all know, of course, that Hogwarts was founded over a thousand years ago, the precise date is uncertain, by the four greatest witches and wizards of the age. The four schoolhouses are named after them. Godric Gryffindor, Helga Hufflepuff, Rowena Ravenclaw, and Salazar Slytherin. They built this castle together, far from prying muggle eyes. For it was an age when magic was feared by common people, and witches and wizards suffered much persecution. He paused, gazed blaringly around the room, and continued. For a few years, the founders worked in harmony together, seeking out youngsters who showed signs of magic and bringing them to the castle to be educated. But then disagreements sprang up between them. A rift began to grow between Slytherin and the others. Slytherin wished to be more selective about the students admitted to Hogwarts. He believed that magical learning should be kept within all magic families. He disliked taking students of muggle parentage, believing them to be untrustworthy. After a while, there was a serious argument on the subject between Slytherin and Gryffindor, and Slytherin left the school. Professor Binns paused again, pursing his lips, looking like a wrinkled old tortoise. 
Reliable historical sources tell us this much, he said. But these honest facts have been obscured by the fanciful legend of the Chamber of Secrets. The story goes that Slytherin had built a hidden chamber in the castle, of which the other founders knew nothing. Slytherin, according to legend, sealed the Chamber of Secrets so that none would be able to open it until his own true heir arrived at the school. The heir alone would be able to unseal the Chamber of Secrets, unleash the horror within, and use it to purge the school of all who were unworthy to study magic. There was silence as he finished telling the story, but it wasn't the usual sleepy silence that filled Professor Binz's classes. There was unease in the air as everyone continued to watch him, hoping for more. Professor Binz looked faintly annoyed. The whole thing is arrant, of course, he said. Naturally, the school has been searched for evidence of such a chamber many times. By the most learned witches and wizards, it does not exist. A tale told to frighten the gullible. Hermione's hand was back in the air. Sir, what exactly do you mean by the horror within the chamber? That is believed to be some sort of monster, which the heir of Slytherin alone can control, said Professor Binns in his dry, reedy voice. The class exchanged nervous looks. I tell you, the thing does not exist, said Professor Binns, shuffling his books. There is no chamber and no monster. But sir, said Seamus Finnegan, if the chamber can only be opened by Slytherin's true heir, no one else will be able to find it, would they? Nonsense, oh... Nonsense, oh flat, oh flatty, uh, <laughs> oh flatty, the professor spins in an aggravated voice. If a long succession of, sorry, if a long succession of Hogwarts headmasters and headmistresses haven't found the thing. That's it. That's it. If a long succession of Hogwarts headmasters and headmistresses haven't found the thing, but Professor, piped up Parvati Patil, you probably have to use dark magic to open it. Just because a wizard doesn't use dark magic doesn't mean he can't, Miss Pennyfeather. Snap Professor Binns. I repeat, if the likes of Dumbledore But maybe you've got to be related to Slytherin so Dumbledore couldn't, began Dean Thomas, but Professor Binns had had enough. That will do, he said sharply. It is a myth. It does not exist. There is not a shred of evidence that Slytherin ever built so much as a secret broom cupboard. I regret telling you such a foolish story. We will, we will return, if you please, to history, to solid, believable, verifiable fact. And within five minutes, the class sunk back into its usual to pour. I always knew Salazar Slytherin was a twisted old loony, Ron told Harry and Hermione as they fought their way through the teeming corridors at the end of the lesson to drop their bags, or to drop off their bags before dinner. But I never knew he started all this pure blood stuff. I wouldn't be in his house if you paid me. 
Honestly, if the sorting hat had tried to put me in Slytherin, I'd have got on the train straight back home. Hermione nodded uh, fervently, but Harry didn't say anything. His stomach had just dropped unpleasantly. Harry had never told Ron and Hermione that the sorting hat had seriously considered putting him in Slytherin. He could remember it as though it was yesterday, the small voice that had spoken in his ear when he placed the hat on his head a year before. You could be great, you know. It's all here in your head. And Slytherin would help you on the way to greatness, no doubt about that. But Harry, who had already heard of Slytherin House's reputation for turning out dark wizards, had brought have a thought desperately. Not Slytherin. And the hat had said, Oh well, if you're sure, better be Gryffindor. As they were shunted along in a throng, Colin Creevy went past. Hiya, Harry. Hello, Colin said Harry automatically. Harry, Harry, a boy in my class has been saying you're... But Colin was so small he couldn't fight against the tide of people bearing him towards the Great Hall. They heard him squeak, See you, Harry! And he was gone. What's a boy in his class saying about... What's a boy in his class saying about you? Hermione wondered. That I'm Slytherin's heir, I expect, said Harry, his stomach dropping another inch so, or so, as he suddenly remembered the way Justin Finch Fletchley had run away from him at lunchtime. People here will believe anything, said Ron in disgust. The crowd thinned and they were able to climb the next staircase without difficulty. Do you, re do you really think there's a chamber of secrets? Ron asked Hermione. I don't know, said her, uh, she said frowning. Dumbledore couldn't cure Mrs Norris, that makes me think. Whatever attacked her might not be, well, human. As she spoke, they turned a corner and found themselves at the end of the very corridor where the attack had happened. They stopped and looked. The scene was just as it had been the night before, uh, uh, that night, except there was no stiff cat hanging from a torch bracket, and an empty chair stood against the wall bearing the message, The Chamber of Secrets has been opened. That's where Filch has been keeping guard, said Ron. They looked at each other. The corridor was deserted. Can't hurt to have a poke around, said Harry, dropping his bag and getting to his hands and knees so that he could crawl along, searching for clues. Scorch marks, he said, here and here and there. Come and look at this, said Hermione. This is funny. Harry got up and crossed to the window next to the message on the wall. Hermione was pointing at the topmost pane, where around twenty spiders were scuttling apparently fighting to get through the small crack in the glass. A long silvery thread was dangling like a rope, as though it had all, as though they had all climbed it in their hurry to get outside. Have you ever seen spiders out like that? said Hermione wonderingly. No, said Harry. Have you, Ron? Ron? Ron looked over his shoulder, and he looked over his shoulder. Ron was standing well back and seemed to be fighting the impulse to run. What's up? said Harry. I... 
don't like spiders, said Ron tensely. I never knew that, said Hermione, looking at Ron in surprise. You've used spiders in potions loads of times. I don't mind them dead, said Ron, who was carefully looking anywhere but the win anywhere but at the window. I just don't like the way they move. Hermione giggled. That's not funny, said Ron fiercely. If you must know, when I was free, Fred turned my, my teddy bear into a dirty grey spider before and because I broke his toy broomstick. You wouldn't like them either if you'd been holding your bear and suddenly it had too many legs and you broke off shuddering. Hermione was obviously still trying not to laugh. Feeling they had better get out, uh, better get off the subject, Harry said, Remember all that water on the floor? Where did that come from? Someone's mopped it up. It was about here, said Ron, recovering himself to walk a few paces past Filch's chair and pointing. Level with this door. He reached for the brass doorknob, but suddenly withdrew his hand, as though he'd been burned. What's the matter? said Harry. Can't go in there, said Ron gruffly. That's a girl's toilet. Oh, Ron, there won't be anyone in there, said Hermione, standing up and coming over. That's Moaning Myrtle's place. Come on, let's have a look. And ignoring the large out-of-order sign, she opened the door. It was the gloomiest, most depressing bathroom Harry had ever set foot in. Under a large, cracked and spotted mirror, were a row of chipped stone sinks. The floor was damp and reflected, the dull light given off by the stubs of a few candles burning low in their, in their holders. The wooden doors to the cubicles were flaking and scratched and one of them was dangling off its hinges. Hermione put her fingers and lips put her fingers to her lips and set off towards the end cubicle. When she reached it, she said, Hello, Myrtle, how are you? Harry and Ron went to look. Moaning Myrtle was floating on a cistern of the, to on the, cistern of the toilet, poking a spot on her chin. This is a girl's bathroom, she said, I am Ron and Harry suspiciously. They're not girls. No, Hermione agreed. I just wanted to show them how uh, nice it was in here. Not nice it is in here. She waved vaguely at the dirty old mirror and the damn floor. Ask her if she saw anything, Harry, Harry, Harry mouthed to Hermione. What are you whispering, said Myrtle, staring at him. Nothing, said Harry quickly. We wanted to ask. I wish people would stop talking behind my back, said Myrtle in a voice choked with tears. I do have feelings, you know, even if I am dead, even if I am dead. Myrtle, no one wants to upset you, said Hermione. Harry only, no one wants to upset me. That's a good one, howled Myrtle. My life was nothing but misery at this place, and, and now people come along ruining my death. We wanted to ask you if you'd seen anything funny lately, said Hermione, quickly. Because a cat was attacked right outside your front door on Halloween. 
Did you see anyone near here that night? said Harry. I wasn't I wasn't paying attention, said Myrtle dramatically. Please upset me so much I came here and tried to kill myself. Then of course I remember that I'm that I'm already dead, said Ron helpfully. Myrtle gave a tragic sob, rose up in the air, turned over, and dived headfirst into the toilet, splashing water all over them, and vanishing from sight, from the direction of her muffled sobs, she had come to rest somewhere in the U-Bend. Harry and Ron stood with their mouths open, but Hermione shrugged wearily and said, Honestly, that was a little cheerful for Myrtle. Come on, let's go. When a loud Harry had barely closed the door on Myrtle's gurgling sobs, when a loud voice made all three of them jump, Ron! Percy Weasley had stopped dead at the head of the stairs. Prefect Badger gleam, an expression of complete shock on his face. That's a girl's bathroom, he, he gasped. What were you? Just having a look around, Ron shrugged. Clues, you know. Percy swelled in a manner that reminded Harry forcefully of Mrs. Weasley. Get away from there, he said, striding towards them and starting to chivy them along, flapping his arms. Don't you care what this looks like? Coming back here while everyone's at dinner? Why shouldn't we be here, said Ron Hartley, stopping short and glaring at Percy. Listen, we never laid a finger on that cat. That's what I told Ginny, said Percy fiercely. But she still seems to think you're going to be expelled. I've never seen her so upset, crying her eyes out. You might think of her, all the first years are, are thoroughly overexcited by this business. You don't care about Ginny, said Ron. His ears were reddening now. You're just, you're just worried I'm going to mess up your chances of being head boy. Five points from Gryffindor, Percy said tensely, fingering his prefect badge. And I hope it teaches you a lesson. No more detective work or I'll write to mum. Harry, Ron and Hermione chose seats as far as possible from Percy in the common room that night. Ron was still in a very bad temper and kept plotting his, charm, his charms homework. When he reached absent, absently for his wand to remove the smudges, it ignited the parchment, fuming almost as much as his homework. Ron slammed the standard book of spells grade 2 shut, to Harry's surprise. Hermione followed suit. Who can it be though? She said in a quiet voice, as though continuing a conversation they'd just been having. Who'd want all the squibs and muggleborns out of Hogwarts? Let's think, said Ron in a mock puzzlement. Who do we know who thinks all muggle-borns are scum? He looked at Hermione. Hermione looked back, unconvinced. If you're talking about Malfoy... Of course I am, said Ron. You heard him. You'll be next, mudbloods. Come on, you've only got to look at his foul rat face to know it's him. 
Malfoy, the heir of Slytherin, said Hermione, sceptically. Look at his family, said Harry, closing his books too. The whole lot of them have been in Slytherin. He's always boasting about it. They could easily be Slytherin's descendants. His father's definitely evil enough. They could have had the key to the Chamber of Secrets for centuries, said Ron, handing it down father to son. Well, said Hermione cautiously, I suppose it's possible. But how do we prove it, said Harry darkly. There might be a way said Hermione slowly, dropping her voice still further with a quick glance across the room at Percy. Of course it would be very difficult and dangerous, very dangerous, and we'd be breaking about fifty school rules, I expect. If in a month or so you feel like explaining, you'll let us know, won't you? said Ron irritably. All right, said Hermione coldly. What we'd need to do is get inside the Slytherin common room to ask Malfoy a few questions without him realising it's us. But that's impossible, Harry said as Ron laughed. No, it's not, said Hermione. All we'd need would be some polyjuice potion. What's that? said Ron and Harry together. Snape mentioned it in class a few weeks ago. Do you think we got nothing better to do in potions than listen to Snape, muttered Ron? It transforms you into somebody else. Think about it. We could change into three of the Slytherins. No one would know it was us. Malfoy would probably tell us anything. He's probably boasting about it in the Slytherin common room right now. If only we could hear him. Apologies. This polygy stuff sounds a bit dodgy to me, said Ron, frowning. What if we were stuck like three, slip, three of the Slytherins forever? It wears off after a while, said Hermione, waving her hand impatiently. But getting hold of the recipe will be very difficult. Snape said it was in a book called... Moste Potente, potions, and it's bound to be in the restricted section of the library. There was only one way to get out a book from the restricted section. You needed a signed note of permission from a teacher. Hard to see why we want that. Uh, hard to see why we want the book, really, said Ron. If we weren't going to try and make one of the potions. I think, said Hermione, that if we made it sound as though we were just interested in the theory, we might stand a chance. Oh, come on, no teacher's going to fall for that, said Ron. They'd have to be really thick. And that was chapter nine. Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. Join me next time as chapter ten dawns upon us. Until then, bye.